questo evento. Good evening and welcome to the final lecture of the 2021 Festival of Economics. In the past three days and a half of meetings, we discussed at length about the role of the state in being a protagonist of the economic and civil life of various countries after the pandemic. Three visions mainly were put forward, the view of the state as a regulator, so the state fixes rules and commits uh, to enforce them. Then the state as a facilitator, as a sort of coach, as somebody said, meaning that the state promotes initiatives and gives an initial thrust and impulse so that things happen. And then private entities come to the fore and follow suit. And then the state as an entrepreneur which directly acts in the economic setting. Clearly different visions were put forward, but I believe that we generally acknowledge the fact that if we have these two additional functions of a facilitator and entrepreneur, there are moments when the state, uh, also in an emergency situation, has to intervene in a strong way into the economic life of a country. So we see these two roles of the state as something which is uh, temporary, limited to specific uh, situations and very specific cases. In general, there has been and there is a consensus on the fact that the state has to act as a regulator. Well, tonight we have a lecture by Jean Tirol, who is the economist who uh, possibly contributed at best uh, to the vision of the state uh, of, uh, of um, uh, regulate, state as a regulator. And he received in 2014 the various Riks Bank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel for that. He was here in person and in virtually. So it was back in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he uh, took the floor uh, as a, a sort of prosecutor in a, a trial, in a court trial against economists. Uh, and then, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he um, came back in 2015. So we all know him, and everybody knows the many things that he has done and the major recognitions that he received. If I may, I would like uh, to um, underline three aspects uh, that I believe are extremely uh, significant. First and foremost, his attention for the other disciplines. He has worked extensively with uh, psychologists, uh, and also with experts in legal matters, jurists. Uh, there is a different terminology which is used, and oftentimes uh, uh, everybody looks at his or her own discipline more than other things. But this was not the case uh, with Jean Tirol, who has always been very good at working with people from other domains. And then the elegance and of uh, the models uh, that he um, produces to reason about very complex things. Of course, um, they are elegantly simple. You know, sometimes economists follow into fall, sorry, into the trap of the models uh, and do things which are not always very easy to understand or very conducive. This is not the case with the work by Jean Tirol. His models are extremely useful, extremely clear and useful, again. And then uh, he has always been engaged uh, from a civil and social viewpoint, starting back in university, supporting research, and also in terms of political uh, choices. Last week, he organized a meeting on the common good 
that uh, was uh, uh, opened uh, by pre by President Macron, so very high level, of course, and uh, they discussed about many topics which we also discussed in the past days. Tonight, he will address us uh, on uh, many aspects uh, that we um, touched upon it, especially one element, which is uh, the digital transition. We uh, spoke a, a lot about the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, which also includes, of course, a digital part. And we talked about transition towards a digital era and what that entails. Jean Tirol is working extensively on that, on the regulation aspect, because, of course, a transition to the digital domain, so to say, means regulating. We, it was said yesterday that multinationals, for instance, have uh, to be uh, better regulated, um, and uh, this is a ju juridical need. Specifically, uh, Jean Tirol will uh, address the aspect of uh, privacy or privacy, and I think that that is very important. I am an economist myself, and as such, and also due to my experience in the administration of this country, I oftentimes had to sort of discuss with the authority for privacy issues because sometimes I felt that they made my institutional work more difficult. It was difficult, for instance, to collect information about people, which is something which we need to enforce or devise policies. Of course, this is one side, and uh, you see, there are always uh, uh, pros and cons. Uh, it's also a question of uh, striking a balance and finding a trade-off between the needs that do exist on the one side uh, to know more about people and on the other side the fact of protecting people's uh, privacy and also guaranteeing the right to oblivion. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Jean Tirol and we thank you so much, uh, Jean Tirol, for being uh, with us uh, tonight. So so you have the floor, Professor. Okay, well, first of all, thanks so much, uh, Tito, for those very kind words and also for inviting me. It's a great honor to be giving this final lecture. It's also a pleasure to be with you in the teatro and, uh, and also virtually, so I'm very pleased to, to do that. Uh, the festival, in my view, is a whole model. It's a whole model because it succeeds in actually making new knowledge uh, available to a wide audience at the same time keeping scientific rigor. And I'm a big fan of the festival. It's, it's very nice to be back. Um, let me share my slides. Um, so, no, sorry, let me just make sure I share my, okay. After more than a year of COVID, I still, I'm still very slow at sharing my slides, but <laughs> here we are. So privacy in the digital age. Um, I'm starting from the concerns we all have about our loss of agency, about the rise of surveillance society. So the most extreme case is, of course, a Chinese social credit system, but there are lots of other concerns. So recently with COVID, we were worried about uh, the state and the platforms collaborating closely, rightly or wrongly, but you know, that was a concern. Uh, we should be concerned about artificial intelligence coming of age, uh, the platform subversions of democracy and fostering polarization, uh, the technological expansion of the public sphere uh, with the smartphones, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, social networks, and also the changing social norms. So for example, it has become more and more common to dox out or chase people. Now, in this context, it's interesting to see that there's been a number of regulatory development. And this, in this area, the European Union actually is a leader. Uh, there was a right to oblivion decision of the European Court of Justice. There was a general data protection regulation. And more recently, there was the Artificial Intelligence Act uh, in April. 
So that connects very closely to the theme of this festival, of this year's festival, which is a return of the state. Because for many years, we have had basically laissez-faire, many, many years of laissez-faire in the internet. And now you see this regulation, and there's some kind of tatonement. Now, how do you analyze this? And I, that's what I would like to do. And my view will be very much uh, an economic view, I have to warn you, but I think it will connect to many other views as well. Um, so here is the outline. First, I will talk about the right to know about what's being done with our data. Then I will make the case for transparency. Then I will make the case against transparency in favor of privacy and the dangers it creates for the individual and also for society at large. And finally, I will deal with a social score, which is expanding right now. So there will be a trade-off between transparency and privacy. And you know, typically, the economists will be on the side of transparency and the philosophers more on the side of privacy. But you know, the economists also you know, bring a broader view nowadays. And it will be somewhere between transparency and privacy, depending on the application. So let me start with a right to know. So we're all concerned about what's being done by platforms with our data and about who has our data. So there are at least four issues. The first is that platforms may share data without our consent. That's one thing. I think the biggest thing actually, the bigger thing is actually, because that you can more easily regulate, is what I call uninformed consent, which is I go on the web dozens of times a day um, I click and I click and I click uh, without knowing what I'm doing. I don't know what the terms mean exactly. I don't know what the partners are, you know, because they, they're sharing with partners and so on. And I don't know what their exact policies will be. Third issue, uh, there is unavoidable sharing. It's hard to escape. So even if I don't go on the web or I go on the web, but I don't grant my consent. Still, it's the case that platforms know a lot about me for two reasons. The first is that my social graph, my friends, my family, my colleagues are going to put information about me in their emails, on social network, and also there will be facial recognition. And there will be lots of stuff which will be known about me, about my politics, about my health, about my taste, even if I don't ever give my consent. The other issue is that uh, people like me are going to reveal stuff about me because we have quality taste. So it's more like indirect disclosure. You know, they directly disclose about themselves, but indirectly about me. And finally, there's the issue of insufficient investment in security. So even if, for example, the platform has pledged not to share my data, then you know there might be a breach of security. Now, let me just make the case that transparency or priority is not quite an individual choice. Um, let's start with the privacy paradox. So the privacy paradox I already mentioned is a disconnect between the user stated preferences and the actual behavior. So I just look at myself. Um, I'm very concerned about my privacy but at the same time, you know, 50 times a day, I click without knowing. So the question is, where, why does the market for privacy fail? The first issue is data externality. So that's just jargon of economists about the fact that other people in my social graph give information about me. The second is my bounded rationality. Or I would tend to think my rationality. Uh, because I view you know, giving consent as involving very high transaction cost. Um, you know, just understanding privacy policy and reading the privacy policy of hundreds of websites and platforms every day and really understanding what they mean is very hard. On top of that, the, I'm bodily rational in the sense I'm impulsive. So I, I want to have um, the, the information about uh, a soccer game which is being played and you know I want to know and I don't want to read privacy policy and I just go and, and read it. 
And finally, there is the issue of unraveling. Um, so imagine that your prospective employer says, you legally don't have to give me access to your Facebook private page, okay? I don't request that of you, but you can. Well, that's enough to force me to do it because if I don't do it, then there's something fishy, something suspicious. And then there's what economists call unraveling. So in the end, everybody has to give the information. So I would say that it's very important to have a strong legal framework. So GDPR has tried to do exactly that. Um, and in my view, it's very well in intention. It's welcomed by the three of us at that. Uh, I certainly haven't changed my behavior since GDPR because it doesn't quite solve the previous issues. It's much too complex for the user. Uh, there is no real change in, in what really matters. There are also issues which I'm not going to talk about, which is competition and policy issues. I'm going to forget about that. That's something that we need to think about. Actually, I'm doing a little bit of work with Patrick Ray on, the, on exactly this issue and trying to think about, you know, GDPR 2.0, but you know, this ongoing work is too early to tell. And but let me try to convince you we need something more than GDPR. So I'm sure all of you have a bank account. And it doesn't come to your mind, you know, to spend all your nights looking at the balance sheet and off balance sheet activities the previous day of your bank. Um, assuming you have the data, assuming that you have the expertise to do so, um, you know, you might say, okay, we could have short term deposits that are not insured. And, you know, the next day, you know, at 9 a.m., you can withdraw your money if you're not happy with the way that the bank is, 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 is run and you fear about your deposits. Um, that will not be efficient. Let's assume it's doable and it's obviously not doable, but it will not be efficient for all of us to spend all our nights, you know, overseeing our banks. Similarly, after this, um, this festival, after this session, you'll be go, going onto the main square, one of the main squares in, in Trento and have a dinner. Um, I hope you can do that. It's, it's, it's doable now in France. Um, and um, you'll be wondering, of course, you know, is the food safe in that restaurant? Um, now, you're not going to look at the supply chain of the restaurants you're going, you're going to tonight. Um, it will be a huge amount of work, even if you have the data. Uh, so in the end, you need a regulator to do the job for you. Where do you place a cursor between transparency and privacy? So, you know, there is a view which says transparency is optimal. And even Posner, who is a remarkable uh, lawyer, said, yeah, at some point, uh, non-disclosure becomes fraud. Um, at the same time, you know, we, we all know about what lack of privacy means. I mean, you all, we all read science, science fiction books and, and movie, watch movies, but it's not only science fiction. I mean, just think about uh, is German, is Gleason a mensch? You know, the the transparent, the glass, uh, glass man. Um, this is serious. So let me first make the case for transparency. It's very much of an, an economic case in a sense. And it's a good case, it's fine. Uh, the first is about incentives. Uh, the transparency, transparency is going to create accountability. So, if we perform well as workers, we get better jobs because future employers will know about our performance. Same thing for suppliers, if there are ratings, if there are reviews, um, then there will be a better incentive to perform well. Same thing, politicians will have less incentive to be corrupt if their corruption is exposed to a wider public. And according to the social scoring proponent, people who are subject to a social core will drive slower in the city, they will supply more public goods, they will behave in a greener fashion, uh, and so on and so forth. They will commit less crime. And there's something to be said in favor of that. 
Um, there is a huge lab and field experimental literature showing that be people behave more prosocially when they observe by others. I mean, just by introspection, when we observe, we also always behave better. Uh, that's true. I mean, the experiments have done that with charitable contribution, public good provision, voting, blood donation, and so forth. So there's no question this is the right point. The second point of economics, I would say, is about allocative efficiency. So try to make sure that you get the right matches. So you, you must facilitate good matches and avoid wrong ones. So you want to avoid matching with sexual predators or corrupt politicians. So you don't want, you want people not to vote for corrupt, corrupt politician, and you want to, people to stay away from sexual predators. And conversely, you know, if you have more information, that may be good actually to facilitate trade. Because if there is a lot of symmetric information, it's easy, for example, to lend to someone. And actually that what happened, for example, with uh, the AI, which is used by Alibaba on financial, which allowed trade and lending, I'm sure, lending to millions of uh, small enterprises because it created trust in the system. It's not completely true, as, uh, uh, as many of you know, of course, is that when, and one of the concerns about making stress tests in banking public is that, sure, it can reassure markets, but it also may create a bank run. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. Now, the case against transparency is manifold, OK? The first thing is that transparency is going to induce posturing. Um, transparency creates accountability, but it also may create too much accountability. So let's start with a more minor thing. A consensual issue with small excites, very small excites. So consensual means we'll agree about what's right and what's wrong, or more or less. So we all agree, for example, that politeness is nice. At the same time, wishing happy birthday to all your Facebook friends. I mean, I'm sure Tito must have you know, tens of thousands of friends. You know, many of those friends, you don't even know them. So you, know, you, you may not want to, to, to wish happy birthday to, to people you hardly know who are not your friends. Uh, you know, that doesn't make any sense. But more generally, there's the issue of excessive uh, attention to self-presentation. And you know, if you have seen uh, some episode of, of Black Mirror, for example, uh, you know what this means. Now, the most serious issue is really about divisive issues. So divisive issues are issues where um, you know, there's no, people don't agree what, about what's right and wrong. You have people on the left and people on the right. Um, so we can differ in our views about religion, about politics, about sexuality, about soft drugs, about social roles, and so on. Those are issues which are very important issues because they divide society. And of course, that uh, when you have divisive issues, you may be afraid uh, if you have transparency uh, on acting, taking a stance, or you may defer to the majoritarian view. And that's one of the reasons, or actually the two reasons of excess posturing, basically determine many philosophers' view that privacy foster emancipation and authenticity. So Sartre, for example, talk about privacy, the need for privacy, for authenticity of behavior. Or Bernard Williams, for example, said to act morally is to act autonomously, not as a result of social pressure. OK? Other costs of transparency, self-restraint. And there are two sub costs. The first I will discuss later on is you keep on maintaining, maintaining the same behavior, but you are in a safe space. 
So you reduce your use of public spaces. So for example, a reproof sexual minority may not enjoy the public space the streets, for example, together. And another example is that you may have drug users or aborting women who result, who result to untrustworthy providers. The other possibility in terms of uh, creating a safe space is to select your social graph in a specific way. So you focus your social graph on like-minded people who behave similarly. But in that case, of course, there is a loss of diversity and opportunities. There are some of your friends you don't cultivate anymore. Um, you just focus on your in-group of people who think like you or behave like you. And those are social costs, of course. And there are price, you know, there are social, there are costs for the individuals. The other possibility is that you change your behavior altogether. So, starting with the last bu bullet, uh, you may not check into a drug rehab center or share information with a physician if you are not guaranteed privacy. Another, there was an economics paper on that, a chilling effect of, uh, of public spaces. So people don't dare to speak their mind. Um, if there is some correlation between the stance and some socially undesirable type or perceived on so socially unde undesirable type. So for example, let's assume I'm in favor of drug liberalization. I may still not argue in favor of drug liberalization because I might be concerned that you think actually I'm a drug addict. Whether I'm, I'm an artist, there may be some correlation between the two. Third cost, which has been studied a huge amount by economists, is discrimination. So there is price discrimination and the concern about surplus extraction. So the platforms nowadays have so much data about you that they know more or less your willingness to pay for goods and services. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but they know a lot more about you than they used to, and therefore they can tell their prices and terms and conditions so as to extract, to, to extract your behavioral surplus. They may also unload lemons on consumer whose search pattern shows they don't have a clue or their emails. And there is the issue of algorithmic fairness as well. Now, the other thing um, which has been emphasized, actually that, that was 50 years ago now in economics by Eschleifer is a breakdown of insurance. So if you have too much information, insurance might be destroyed. So for example, if you have a system of private insurance in which there is no regulation on discrimination, then the people who are known to have a bleak future in terms of their health uh, won't, get, you know, won't get coverage. And we need universal coverage because we are not responsible for health, more or less, and for, for especially for our genes. But that's broader than that. It's not only health, it might be the amplification of mistakes. Um, it might be the consequences of, uh, of a mistake for one's personal life being, uh, becoming a social paria. It could be the reduced access to a labor market. It could be the stigmatization of the poor. Fourth item, uh, which was mentioned by Tito already, the violation of the right to be forgotten. A very fundamental principle in law is that we should be paying for our misdeed, but then once we have paid for the misdeed, we, with, we restart with a clean slate. We have a second chance. And actually, this is not in law. Actually, most religions have this uh, principle. Now, this is also actually an incentive perspective, because the idea is that if you start with a clean slate, uh, you will behave better. Um, now, you often have that in bankruptcy. Um, you often have that for young people for good reason, okay? And you have that for most crimes, 
Okay. Now, this I think is a pretty good principle. Not all of them. I mean, you, you don't want a politician who has been incredibly corrupt, for example, to come back uh, 15 years later and and, you know, and and be elected again. But you know, it's on average, it's a pretty good uh, policy. And uh, the problem with the digital record is is that it's going to last forever. And that's really an issue, I think, because the stigma is still around. Device. So let me return to divisive issues. I remind you there might be sexual orientation, uh, politics, uh, religion, uh, vegan and meat eaters, abortion, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there are many, many of them. Um, and the problem with them is that we don't agree on necessarily agree on what's right and wrong. And that may trigger discrimination, uh, fuel hatred, that may trigger violence, okay? And therefore, there's a very high pride and social cost. This is something I'm doing uh, some work on, um, which is still preliminary, but uh, what I do is to look at a demand for partial transparency on the divisive issue. So, we don't want to be fully transparent. Actually, what we want to do is to let our behavior known to our in-group. Our in-group is the like-minded individuals who choose the same behavior. That's, in a sense, a safe space. But it's a safe space if the behavior is not known to the out-group, people who behave differently, who are different from us. Because if we have full transparency, which include transparency to the outgroup, that makes people shy to act. So that's why in practice, we have often retreat in a safe space. It can be physical, that can be a home, behavior in a home, in a pride club, in a church, in a lodge, you know, in a bull right, bullfight ring, another controversial, uh, conflictual uh, issue. Uh, a political party and so on and so forth. So it can be virtual. Actually, Facebook for a long time has been using that, you know, sending you to a face, safe space of like-minded people. And of course, the benefit is that it generates less hostility. But it doesn't generate authenticity. I mean, this is not, it doesn't vindicate the point of view of Sartre and others. Um, and actually, you know, it, it it creates a lot of signaling. Um, there's this, a lot of social pressure. And actually, the people who don't take sides for the left or the right, say, um, they are kind of neutral agents. They are viewed suspiciously by both sides if in a safe space equilibrium. Uh, because you might be one of those bad guys who thinks very differently, who thinks very differently from me. Um, and that, as I mentioned, creation of a safe space comes with pride costs, which is a reduced use of the public space and the foregoing of desirable relationship and the limited diversity of one's social graph. There are many interesting things to look at. And let me ignore the first bullet, which is what happens when the cost is in terms of altering the social graph. But something which comes on top of the social cost uh, of the price, oh, sorry, of the cost for the individual is a social cost. Once you are in a safe space, then there is an incentive for one-upmanship. Um, you you keep on signaling. You want to show that castle is on the pope, um, and that can be either voluntary or it could be enforced by the sponsor of the safe space because they can threaten to out you. By the way, outing is a consequence of one of those, uh, of the theory because, you know, you have chosen a safe space for a good reason. So you don't want to be outed from this safe space or exclude you. Okay. So it can be this extra signaling can be either voluntary or enforced by the sponsors of the safe space. And that means that there will be one-sided narratives. There will be hate speech. There will be conspiracy theories. There will be Facebook, Facebook groups. And finally, um, and I 
still, I think I still have a couple of minutes. Tito, is that all right? Yes, um, please. Yes. So let me just finish with the issue of social scores. So that's something which, um, which is, and I want to, to emphasize that it's not, not solely Chinese. Chinese is an, in an advanced technologically and as a conducive political situation. Um, but this is going to happen in many countries if we don't pay attention. So the China's social credit system, which was due to be rolled out in 2020, but of course with COVID, it has, it has changed a little bit, but is going to aggregate for each person and also each business as well, but each person um, is going to aggregate various behavior into a single criterion. Some you might think are reasonable, like did I pay my debts? Did I pay my taxes? Am I polluting? Do I drive too fast in the streets of Toulouse or, or Trento? Um, whatever, okay? Um, in principle, fake news belongs to that. Also, we have to be, uh, to be aware of the definition of fake news because of course in, in some countries, the notion of fake news is basically anything which has any disagreement with the government. Um, and then there are some clearly unappealing ones, uh, like a social graph, who are my friends, for example, my personal traits, my political or religious opinions. So here we, we get back in part to uh, divisive issues. Now, what is it going to be used for in China? The first is public stigmatization. So, you know, being, being on, on list on, uh, on billboards in the street and all those things. Um, and also you, you love it on your phone and, and your card. Um, but also there will be more economic like uh, restrictions to employment, transportation, visa abroad, even access to the best school or universities. Okay. Now, um, in a paper I've written on that and the next step for me and my colleagues will be actually to test it on Blakely, but uh, um, the individuals are engaged in stable relationships. So we all are engaged in some kind of private sphere, if you want, a family, a friends, uh, uh, the inhabitants of a village, but also in, in there is a public sphere um, of people we have more transient relationship with on platforms, on large city, in large cities and so on. And we care about our social image. That's, that's, that's a very important ingredient. And I, as I said, there's a lot of evidence that's the case. We, we care about what people think about us. And therefore that means that disclosure of any information like a social score will have an impact is important. Whether it's good or bad is a different issue, but it's going to have an impact um, and it's going to discipline people in some way. Now, in the theoretical framework I've developed, you know, my past behavior may be known to others in two ways. Either you have been interacting directly with me um, or you learn from my previous behavior through the social score, which embodies, um, which summarize in a sense my previous behaviors. So in China you have like, in some pilots you have like 1000 different <laughs> dimension to, and it's aggregated with some weights into a single social score. So for example, you might be blacklisted or not. I might be blacklisted or not. But in China it's much finer than that actually. It's a, it's a three digit number. It's, a, it's very fine grading. Um, the release of a social score, of course, is going to boost image concern and affect behavior. It's going to impact uh, the reputation uh, and extend it to uh, new partners, but also the stable partners or the private sphere will get a better assessment of my behavior. Okay. Um, if you have if you have consensual issues and sizable externalities, it's rather a good thing because it's going to improve behavior. 
But what I show is that the state, and in the paper I also show platforms and religious organizations can exploit agents' interests in each other's social score to do something else, which is to, instead of promoting pro-sociality, it's to promote political compliance. Uh, so the idea is bundling. So the social score aggregates into a single score, um, both my pro-social behavior or anti-social behavior, but also whether I told the line politically, uh, political clients, compliance. Okay, and the other thing that I, I study is uh, guilt by association, but I'll come back to that. So what I show is that the state will want to bundle the two, so pro-sociality and compliance with the political stance, policies, if and only if it's sufficiently autocratic. Autocratic means that it puts weight, a lot of weight on staying in power, on you know, suppressing dissent compared to um, to welfare of the people. And the ability to affect behavior through bonding is much, so social control by the government is going to be much stronger in a society of strangers and in a society with more stable relationships, simply because, you know, the, when you have a stable society, um, people know each other, so they cannot be influenced too much by what the government says. Okay, and there are a bunch of other interesting issues. Since I'm getting late, let me um, finish with enlisting the social graph. Guilt by association is about coloring a pe person's perception by the company she keeps. Um, sorry, Tito, you are my friend, and because I'm blacklisted, you are going to be blacklisted as well, okay? Um, so the relationship with someone on a blacklist is going to taint the reputation of those who a priori will not be. The consequence of the concern is the destruction of the social fabric. Nobody wants to be seen in the streets or in a cafe or in a theater uh, communicating with a low rating person. So basically you destroy the social fabric. So embodying an individual social graph into a social score is going to destroy the social fabric. People cut beneficial ties with others. And we know that from Eastern Germany, of course. And it's going for that reason to apply mainly to autocratic regimes because on the other hand, they strengthen the state's hold on society because it makes a punishment for non-compliance, non-political compliance uh, harsher. And as I say, it's a very ancient strategy you know, with very rudimentary means, um, the Stasi managed to break the social fabric. But nowadays, the marginal cost of knowing your social graph has, has gone down to zero, almost zero. Because you have cameras everywhere, you have facial recognition, which is really very good nowadays. You have AI applied to communication, social network, emails, uh, phone calls, and so on it's very easy to understand what your social graph is, just like your opinions as well. So some servers uh, suffice actually to perform tasks which were very labor intensive in the past. Okay, let me, I've been too long, let me conclude here. Um, of course, I'm a big fan of our digital future. Um, it's, it's going to promote our living standards, our health, our inclusiveness if we use it well, but it's full of dangers. So the idea is not to renounce, it's impossible in a way, our digital future, but really to address those uh, social, societal challenges. For that, we need to use economic and social science analysis and confront all the ethical dilemma to start building smart regulations of privacy. And we really here, it comes back to the theme of, of, uh, of uh, the, um, festival, which is the return of the state, because we really need a smart return of the state here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. I told you 
earlier on that uh, Jean Tirole's models are extremely uh, elegant, and indeed this elegance uh, lies in the fact of naming exactly what issues are and what the relevant trade-offs are, and this was extremely clear in uh, this uh, contribution uh, about this very uh, difficult uh, um, aspect. We have time for a couple of questions from the audience. If any. I wonder whether we have jurists uh, in, in the audience who wish to ask a question. I, I actually have a question about current issues because we went through the pandemic. So I wonder whether these. Uh, uh, that you told us also applies to this. The privacy authority in Italy recently established that uh, an employer cannot ask uh, an employee whether he or she got vaccinated or not. In addition, the employer cannot declare uh, not even on a voluntary basis whether he or she received a vaccine. So the only way by which an employer can know something about the vaccination of employees is addressing the uh, the local health authority, uh, and he or, or she will receive an aggregate data about the percentage of workers who got vaccinated. This is a divisive issue, of course, because vaccination is controversial, and we know that. There is also an aspect of externality, which is very strong, and which we touched upon uh, over this period in terms of uh, the risk of contagion. And then we have an aspect which pertains to uh, sensitive information, because, of course, being vaccinated is something which is absolutely sensitive as a piece of data. So I wonder how that relates uh, to the overall conceptual framework that you proposed. Well, as you say, uh, very clearly, this is a divisive issue. I, I tend to be on one side of the, of the debate, I'm afraid. I'm a bit of um, an ayatollah for, for vaccination. But um, so, yeah, I mean, in all countries, there are issues. In France, for example, we, um, you know, we, we cannot force a doctor or, or nurse to be vaccinated. And I think I'm feeling very uneasy about it because I understand the point that uh, we have to respect opinion and so on, but at the same time, those people are in contact with patients all the time. And I guess you're making a little bit the same point with employees in the firm. Uh, there is a huge externality of um, infecting someone. So I, I will say, um, you know, I, I just re feel, received an email from my teacher, uh, you know, because I, I usually go there in July. Uh, not this year, but uh, you know the the, the policy uh, at MIT will be actually to ask for a pandemic pass. So if you want to go to MIT, uh, you have to show that you have been vaccinated. Um, and you know there is a trade-off between privacy and, and efficiency. And the efficiency is clearly everybody should be vaccinated, in my view, period, except those for which which have some reason not to, some good reason, uh, else reason not to. But you know. By and large, we all have to be vaccinated. And you know, what I don't understand is that in school it's a no-brainer. And you know, you can, if you want to, to put your children in a school in France, you have to. Your children have to be vaccinated. Period. And I think it's a good policy. Um, so that's difficult because, yeah, I mean, I real, I realize I'm, I'm, I'm lying on, on one side of the debate, and not everybody should be agreeing with me. <laughs> but at the same time, I have a tendency to think that we. No, I understand the concern that employers should not be knowing everything about the health of their employees. But the question is, you know, is that a bad thing? Um, you know, COVID, for example, I don't think there is such a stigma on having COVID, much less um, on having some other illnesses which might lead you to be fired or at least not promoted. Um, on COVID, there is not that much of a stigma because it's a it's something you may you may be catching uh, you know involuntarily and it's a short term thing anyway. I mean, unless you have long COVID, of course, long COVID might be another issue. I agree. Um, now the pandemic has revealed lots of ethical dilemmas, and 
what I'm what I'm complaining about is really that we were not prepared. So it's just like with the supplies, in a sense. We were not prepared for the pandemics. Even so, it's pretty clear that the pandemics uh, was going to happen at some point. You know, not only viruses, but you know, there's antibio resistance, there's uh, melting of the, of the permafrost, there is uh, biological warfare, and so I mean, it's pretty clear that that's something that could have happened and will happen again. And we were totally unprepared, not only in terms of the healthcare system, but we were also unprepared in terms of the overall debate on what we should be doing in that case. So an example, of course, was, uh, you know, that happened in Italy and France, who should have the priority if there are not enough beds or respirators? Um, you know, that was an example of the trolley dilemma that philosophers have been working on for centuries, I would say, exaggerating a little bit, but you know, you know, and the value of life, okay? So there, there, there were choices which were made, but uh, they were made more, for the first time actually, they were not completely implicit, they were discussed. But then the pandemic passed and all those things, or whether people should be vaccinated, haven't been discussed, and I think it's a pity. So what we should be doing is collectively, basically, uh, say, here are the benefits, here are the costs, and let's try to think about next time. What do we want to do? What are we? How can we prevent abuses of, of transparency? You know, um, how are we going to react to all those things? And and you know, my view is that at this stage, we still won't be prepared. Um, that's a pity. I think, I think we need to, to have this kind of discussion. Molto importante, no? Quello che ci ha detto. Well, what you said is very important. So the uh, need to discuss about these issues. I'm afraid that the time available uh, has ended. Uh, I would like to draw some conclusions about the festival, but uh, um, before doing that, uh, well, we carried out a survey during the festival among the speakers, we raised two questions for them on the topics discussed here. The first is about their consensus about vaccines, whether they agree or not on the following statement. That is that a temporary weaver on vaccine could enable less developed countries to accelerate their vaccines campaigns. And the score was from one to five. Five perfectly, agree. I perfectly agree. One, I don't agree. And halfway is a neutral position and we had as a result of this uh, survey, well, about uh, 60 speakers out of 100 uh, have uh, answered, and the score was four. So 60 speakers agree on the need uh, to have uh, a vaccine uh, patent uh, weaver. And then we differentiated between economists and non-economists. So we know that, you know that at the festival we don't only have economists but other professionals. And here the score was slightly lower, 3.7. The second question that we raised was about the distribution of the vaccines. And the statement was, in order to face uh, the consequences of the pandemic on public debt uh, and uh, income distribution, OECD countries uh, should increase uh, wealth uh, taxes. The same uh, rule, one, I don't agree, five, uh, I agree. And the average score was uh, 4.8, so a relative uh, agreement uh, on this uh, statement. There is something about economists uh, that I would like to underline. So economists uh, are less in agreement with this uh, statement. Uh, 
Well, together with the answer, we asked uh, uh, people to uh, tell us uh, what was the level of com confidence uh, uh, about their statement. And what's interesting is that economists uh, tend to be less uh, sure about uh, their answer as compared to non-economists. Uh, well, this is indicative of a way of thinking of economists uh, who often tend uh, to look at pros and cons uh, and understand uh, uh, details, uh, uh, so going uh, depth. So, uh, very often these uh, problems do not have simple answers, uh, and then each problem uh, requires a specific uh, knowledge. Uh, you cannot know everything, and also in the area of economics, uh, you may be an expert in uh, one issue, but not in uh, many other issues. Well, there is uh, another point uh, that I would like uh, to make uh, with reference to economists. Uh, there is an aspect uh, about the answers of economists uh, where I uh, do not really uh, agree. I dare not to be agree. And all the answers are available in the um, website of the festival. Uh, some of them also left uh, uh, explanations, uh, uh, wrote explanations, so you can read them. Well, there are several of my colleagues uh, that uh, in terms of the distribution, uh, um, uh, well, they wrote uh, that uh, they didn't uh, uh, feel uh, uh, like uh, giving an answer because these are aspects uh, which uh, relate uh, uh, to uh, moral or ideal situations which uh, are independent of their uh, profession and their um, being an economist. Well, I'm not so convinced about that. Also, in the light of the discussions that we have had in this day, the task of a state is not that of setting rules only, but uh, to be sure that these rules are understood, implemented, and that uh, there is uh, a widespread uh, awareness uh, about the rightness of these uh, rules. Uh, otherwise, uh, such uh, rules uh, will not uh, be applied. Uh, well, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we had several levels of application of the rules uh, about uh, uh, masks, uh, for example. Well, a state uh, which uh, cannot uh, convince uh, about the need uh, to do some things uh, will uh, hardly be able to implement uh, uh, other regulations. Uh, so it's not enough to establish uh, uh, what are the good rules and the bad rules. Uh, you also have to think about uh, um, civic uh, sense uh, and how people react uh, to the introduction of these rules. Uh, well, to cut a long story short, uh, uh, let's say that uh, on such fundamental issues, uh, above all, after such a mm, severe uh, crisis, uh, uh, which has uh, hit uh, very vulnerable people, I think that we should have a discussion about uh, fiscal equality, also uh, involving uh, economists uh, uh, who want to remain a scientist, uh, who look uh, at things uh, scientifically. Because if we look at uh, surveys uh, carried out in the US and other countries, after the pandemic, uh, we see that uh, there is a greater awareness about the fact uh, that there is a serious problem of fiscal equality. Uh, because probably weaker citizens have paid uh, the highest uh, cost, uh, not only in terms uh, of uh, um, debts, uh, but also in terms of uh, uh, economic losses. Uh, and there uh, are people who got richer, including uh, big companies. Uh, so, this uh, raises a question of uh, equality that we need uh, to face. Uh, well, we spoke about the National Plan of Resilience and Recovery, and that uh, will entail a reallocation of jobs, uh, uh, transition to the digital economy, uh, and cost uh, for many people. Unless we tackle the issue of uh, fairness and equity, we 
uh, will have uh, many difficulties in um, enforcing that plan. Um, and I'm sorry for speaking at length about this. I would like to tell you a few figures about uh, the festival. We are going back to business as usual. Of course, we are not there yet. But we have uh, filled all the uh, rooms uh, um, for the many meetings, the dozens of meetings uh, we had over these uh, days. You see, we had a limited number of uh, uh, people uh, that could enter, but we had for one person in presence dozens of others uh, uh, using uh, the streaming uh, uh, facility to follow proceedings. Uh, um, 1.3 million views is what we had today. Um, the people who visited the website to see what was going on at the festival, we know that the f a festival needs people, uh, crowded halls and theaters and people in the streets, uh, squares, talking with the speakers. Uh, and uh, speaking among each other, we, I'm sure, we are sure that we will go back to that. And the hope is really that next year we have again an edition which is fully in person. I would also like to add that we had a strong impact at the media level. An index of that is the fact that despite the restrictions, despite the fact that journalists could only remain outside and so on and so forth, we go back to the pre-COVID levels of accredited journalists. So uh, this is the right direction. We are very happy about all the things that I told you about. Having said that, now I would like to call on stage the uh, governor of the province uh, of uh, Trento, um, the mayor Ianeselli, the rector of the University of Trento de Florian, Giuseppe La Terza, and Enzo Cipolletta, whom I do not need to introduce within the context of this festival so that we can uh, formally conclude the festival and close the festival. No, no, uh, Jean. Jean, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I uh, actually let you there following also the final part of the of the festival, but I know that you're happy to be with us. So thank you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, really. It's a fantastic festival. Congratulations. Good evening. With uh, this final event, we close uh, this uh, edition of the Festival of Economics. I would like to thank all participants, all attendants, all speakers, all journalists who uh, participated and attended the various events. I would like to ask uh, Tito, uh, thank uh, Tito Boeri, um, Mr. Cipollette, Mr. La Terza. Thank you for creating this uh, edition and version of the festival. And thank you for believing in this festival. As Tito said today, we can now say that there has been a lot of interest for the festival, a strong participation and a strong sentiment in favor of uh, the festival economics. This was not something that we could take for granted when we started planning it. Now that we know how things uh, have gone, 
Um, we said it would have been a mistake not to organize it in this way, but deciding to do so uh, one, month, one month ago was not an easy decision. Uh, now we are all happy, and uh, this is, you see, Trentino that tries to lead others and do something which was not uh, to be taken for granted. And I would also like to, un to, to stress the fact that we did so in a moment which is a very, moment, a very important moment to relaunch Trentino and the country at large. I would like to thank people working behind the scenes. Uh, uh, those who stand for organizing things, and then the press, of course, communication, PR. I would like to thank uh, Marilena De Francesco. I thank her in the name of the entire organizing team. She has worked so much for this festival, also in terms of managing uh, the arrival of ministers, uh, who, of course, had to be taken care of uh, with a lot of uh, care. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, the law enforcement or, um, forces. Thank you to the fire brigade. I see them in, in the theater. Uh, so this is a general thank you to all those who made the festival possible. Of course, we will see each other again next year if we manage this year to do the festival. We are sure that we will even so, even more so, be able to do so next year. So see you next year on my part.